Hello and welcome back to my presentation on the relationship of Riemannian geometry and condensed metaphysics. In this last part of the talk, I'm going to discuss with you how Riemannian geometry can be used in the context of the renormalization group. What we're going to derive in particular in this part is a dynamical equation that governs the evolution of the thermodynamic metric tensor under the renormalization group process. But first and foremost, let's discuss the motivation for this work. So, at the very beginning, we were looking at these two seemingly distinct concepts. On the one hand, we had the renormalization group, which is an important and powerful tool to understand, detect and analyze phase transitions. On the other hand, we had this new thermodynamic metric tensor where each component corresponds to a physical susceptibility. And clearly this geometric object is also made to detect phase transitions. So a natural question to ask is, can we actually find a connection between these concepts? So we started off with a very simple real space renormalization group procedure, as it is for example used in spin systems. So at the very beginning, we looked at a system consisting of capital N spins, that is described by a set of control parameters which we put into a vector x. Now in one step of the renormalization group process we take away k of the spins and this is done in such a way that the partition function of the system remains invariant up to a prefactor. And as you can see on the, in the second line on this slide this vector beta is what we call the beta function and it Essentially, it's a vector field defined on the, on the manifold parametrized by the control parameters. Now, as a consistency check for our calculations, we used a very simple model, namely the infinite range easing model. So this model, even though it's very simple, has a couple of advantages. One advantage is that you can compute everything explicitly. The partition function, the beta function and also in the renormalization group process no new couplings are generated. The Hamiltonian of this model, just to remind you, is given here. Xi and Xj can either be plus or minus 1. The number Xn describes the coupling strength between the spins and the 1 over n in front of the summation makes the Hamiltonian extensive. Now, uh, the renormalization group flow diagram consists of essentially three fixed points. There's one unstable fixed point at x equals to 1, and there are two stable fixed points at x equals 0 and x equals infinity. Now what we would like to find is a differential equation that tells us how the thermodynamic metric tensor is changing under the renormalization group flow. And just to remind you, the thermodynamic metric is given by the second derivatives of the free energy in this context, where the free energy is simply minus the log of the partition function. Now, the naive approach to this problem is the following. We take the invariance condition of the partition function from the previous slide, take the log of it, so we're at the level of free energies, and then take twice the derivative. But this is in fact not as easy as it looks like and the difficulty here is in the detail. Well, you see, if you look at the right-hand side of this equation, then the first term certainly corresponds to the metric tensor at the point xn, n. However, the second term is a metric tensor that is sort of shifted by, a, by, a, by, an, by an amount n minus k. So what we're doing is we are comparing metric tensors at different points of the manifolds. So you already see that deriving such a dynamical equation that tells you how the metric tensor is changing under the RG flow is somewhat tricky from a technical perspective. And for this reason, I've written the result down for you on this slide. So this equation looks sort of ugly, but I'm now going to explain it to you step by step. 
First of all, let's look on the left-hand side of the equation. This L of beta is what we call the lead derivative with respect to the beta function. And what this is telling you intuitively is that it's, it describes the infinitesimal change of the thermodynamic metric along the integral curves of the vector field beta. And of course there's also a mathematical rigorous definition of this lead derivative, but I don't want to go into the technical details here. And certainly you can also picture this mathematical definition, but I would like to focus on the physics for the moment. Now the operator that is acting on the left hand side on the thermodynamic metric is what we call the renormalization group flow operator. Now this operator describes the absolute change of the metric Gij under the Rg flow and it mainly consists of two parts. The first part is sort of a change in the relative system size and it's given by the operator NDDN. It's because the renormalization group causes a rescaling of the system. The second part of the operator is the lead derivative with respect to the vector field beta. This takes care of the fact that the renormalization group is changing the coupling constants of the system. So the overall change is given by the sum of these operators. Also note that there is an analogy to the material derivative of fluid mechanics. So let's continue with the right hand side of the equation. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, understanding the right-hand side of this equation is still an open question to us. But nevertheless, I would like to point out two things for you. First, I would like to give an intuitive interpretation of the first term on the right-hand side. And second, I would like to argue on why these two terms on the right-hand side may in fact not be that important at all. But let's start off with the first term. So, first of all, let's consider submanifolds of constant free energy. Now, what we notice is that the term gradient of phi is always perpendicular on such a manifold of constant free energy. And as a consequence, this term d squared beta dxi dxj is acting like a force or like a pressure on these sub-manifolds of constant free energy. So this is sort of the interpretation of the first term of the right-hand side. Now, as a next step, in order to understand why the terms on the right-hand side of the differential equation may in fact be not that important, let's look at the entire manifold of control parameters. Now, on this manifold of control parameters, there are certain points that are sort of exceptional. And these exceptional points are the critical points of a physical theory. And so a natural question to ask is, how does the dynamical equation simplify in the vicinity of such a critical point? And to find an answer to this question, we looked at the infinite range easing model. For this model, our dynamical equation is essentially one-dimensional because x is the only control parameter. So I've written this equation down for you here, and I would like to explain now how this equation simplifies in the vicinity of the critical point x equals to 1. So let's start on the left. First we notice that the operator minus n ddn essentially corresponds to a multiplication by minus 1. Why is that? Well, first of all, this is because gxx has, an, has only an independence that comes from direct proportionality. This is because gxx is essentially twice the derivative of the free energy, which is extensive, so proportional to n. Now, on the right-hand side, we notice that the term d phi dx is vanishing close to the critical point because it's proportional to the magnetization. Also we notice that essentially by coincidence the term d squared f dx squared is also vanishing. 
So what we're left with is what mathematicians call the conformal killing equation. It says that L applied to GXX is approximately GXX in the vicinity of a critical point. Now, this is a very beautiful eigenvalue-like equation. And this equation has several interesting consequences. And a first consequence is that it implies that the beta function in the vicinity of the critical point is what one calls a conformal killing vector field. And the existence of such a conformal killing vector field implies the existence of a neuter current or of a conserved quantity in the vicinity of the critical point. So a question that we are asking at the moment is can we find a physical meaning of this conserved quantity that seems to exist in the vicinity of the critical point of the model. And another question that we ask is, is it generically true that close to the critical point this dynamical equation simplifies to the conformal killing equation? So in a sense this is a generic criteria to detect phase transitions. And this also brings me to the end of my talk. Thanks for listening.